this is a French plane. It's, uh, I think it's early 19th century. And it's set to be by some American who wrote a quite an erudite article on the subject. It, uh, it, um, gone into the subject very carefully, an old gentleman, and he wrote an article in the last year or two and he said that this plane was uh, probably unique. He'd never seen one before. So there are, I'm not saying it's unique, I'm saying this gentleman says it's unique, but it's certainly very unusual. And this is a cabinet maker's plane. Personally, I th from a design point of view, I think it's useless, but it's French. What can one say? Uh, but um, it, it's certainly very unusual. Um, what I tend to prefer are things like this. Now this is a saw that's actually been uh, got at as a good work to use, I suppose. It's missing its screws. The blade would probably be twice as long as it is and some idiot has actually deformed it in many ways, I don't know why. But this saw almost certainly would be on an exhibition board of very, very high quality. And what intrigues me about this is the actual handle itself, the absolute beauty of it. And, uh, well, to my eyes it is. Um, and silly little things. So if we turn it upside down like that, this is known as a figure three uh, hand hole. So that part there forms an old fashioned figure three, just like that. Now, why they did that, I've absolutely no idea. But uh, the actual finish of it and the whole thing, when examined very closely, it's made of boxwood and it's absolutely superb. So things like that really get me going. Uh, Sauce particularly I am interested in because from uh, Sheffield never made sauce historically. Uh, they were made, uh, we came late into the business uh, around 1760 uh, because Crucible Castile was uh, first melted in Sheffield uh, by Benjamin Huntsman. Uh, this is another old saw here if I can find one. Question of finding, oh, this is it, yeah, that's it. And this is my a firm called Kenyon. And uh, again, the handle is, but this is relatively crude in its shape to the previous one. And only three saw screws, or rivets they are really, but uh, that will be, that could be late 18th century, that saw. Without saws, you can't cut wood. Very important thing. We don't seem to think about that. Uh, saws had been made previously in other places, but they were very crude by comparison. So the steel had to be made, then it had to be made in sheet form to make the blade thin. And in 1743, there was a device at, w at Wortley, tin mill, called a rolling mill, that uh, came into being. It was built there in 1743 to roll tin plate. And the site is known today as tin mill. Uh, the site's there, all the machinery's gone, of course. But that's that was the first rolling mill, sheet rolling mill, in Sheffield at that time. And I think it had a great influence on the manufacture of saws. So history is bound up all around us. We've got a, uh, for small items, I stick them in drawers. And this is a drawer uh, of, on this particular one, it's cutlery and surgical instruments. There's one or two file making things in. This is a case of ophthalmic knives for uh, surgeons to work on eyes, people's eyes. Uh, these are ivory handled, so these will be, I'm guessing, uh, mid to late 19th century. You can't sterilize ivory, of course, and it's very difficult. The lower ones in this case I've got nickel silver handles which you can sterilise but the blades all go rusty on all of them so you've got to be very careful about it. Um, it just gives you food for thought that uh, people have to use and uh, make such delicate instruments to uh, mend people's eyes with sort of thing to deal with them. 
um, in the same drawer are some file cutting hammers. This, these hammers are extremely unusual. The shape's actually unusual. So I have to turn around for this because the uh, it's used in that manner in order to cut teeth onto a file. So a file, of course, is a steel bar like that. And this one has teeth on it and you use it to smooth things off with. Now, it starts off as a piece of plain steel and it has to have teeth cut on it. So to do that, you need a hammer and you need a chisel. And you have to hit the chisel with the hammer. So on the metal uh, blank, as it's called, is on an anvil that's to you, that you sit on. Uh, but these hammers, most hammers you can use to break toffee with or break bricks with or do what you like, knock nails in with. With these, you can only use it for cutting files. They are very, very unusual and they are almost impossible to acquire. Absolutely. They're an absolute treasure. Uh, I like to think that this particular one is quite delicate in its form. However, this one is a French file cutter's hammer. A bit bigger, but look how crude it is against ours. And I just wonder whether or not. I'm glad I'm an Englishman. Only kidding. Uh, in the next drawer, we, uh, well, it's a, uh, we have button hooks. And that's thing to put in the pocket. And you press Sorry, not a button hook, this is a, a corkscrew rather. This is a corkscrew. This is an interesting one. Same frame, but here we have a this hook here. And it's known as a horse hook. It's for getting stones out of horses hooves. Or as some wag says, it's for getting Boy Scouts out of horses hooves, because that's what they have on Boy Scouts knives. This is another one. And it has a timber scribe on it for marking timber. You can make circles or cut straight lines with it. And they all fit in the pocket like that. So that the sharp parts, when they're closed up, don't catch your clothes. Um, these were usually made in Birmingham, by the way. It's not a Sheffield trade. Ah! Now then, this is quite an interesting one. And it's not actually a tool as such, you don't make things with it. But what it is, it's in the days when uh, lamps were paraffin lit, street lamps were paraffin lit, uh, or even gas lit, uh, the gas light, uh, lamp lighter would go around with one of these on top of a long pole. And inside it would be a wick and they'd put paraffin in it. And by having the flame there, they could put it into the gas lamp, turn the gas on at night, because they used to come round every night in the streets, in order to uh, actually light the lamp. So it's a lamp lighter's lighter. Some tools were made out of old files. When a file has got, gone blunt, what happens is that you, you, they're normally thrown away. But sometimes tools are made out of it. And this particular tool is for getting, um, I'm going to say this, uh, little chisel points that they knocked into horses' hooves. When it was very frosty, a horse, hooves, horses, which were uh, used for drawing carts of one sort or another, used to slip on the cobbles. And to stop them slipping, they used to put some like heavy nails in called frost cogs. And they took them out later on when the uh, frost went. And this is a frost cog remover. So it's like a chisel. And the, it took out the frost cog from the horse's shoe when it wasn't required. But it's made from a rasp. And uh, quite beautifully made. It's file cut on one side and what we call rasp cut on the other side. So that's quite interesting in its own right. Uh, knives have always intrigued me. Uh, knives like this. These are, you'll never see these used in England or in Europe even. Uh, that is a knife made for uh, the warmer regions of the world. It's known as a sisal knife. 
precisely it's like a heavy string, but in its raw form, it's part of a tree and it has to be cut. And that's the knife that cuts it. That's a tea pruning knife. Again, for uh, Ceylon or Malaya or any of the uh, other places in the world. I'm very partial to uh, smoked salmon, and that's a smoked salmon knife. Very thin, very flexible. Uh, it can be bent and it comes back straight again, and extremely thin here. This one has an ivory handle to it. Beautiful material ivory. Certainly I wouldn't kill an elephant to get it, but uh, nevertheless, uh, as a material to hold, it's warm, it's tactile, it's absolutely, I think it's beautiful. Quite a, an interesting uh, article here is an, yet another knife uh, that's known as a mincing knife. Perhaps that's the best way around for it really. And this is for chopping vegetables in a bowl. Uh, it could be a very simple shape, but this particular one looks a bit like an owl with its ears. Uh, and funnily enough, the people who made this were people who made saws. Entirely the same tools, because that's the saw plate that you make the blade with, whatever they use it for this or a saw blade, and this is like, just like a saw handle. But the use is different. So one uh, tool used for cutting wood, and the other one used for cutting vegetables in spite of the fact that the same people made both. So, whether tools are made or used, it's always very interesting how the thing's done. I'm going to take this drawer out because it's easier. Uh, this, I'm very, very keen on measuring tools uh, of all sorts. To measure small dimensions, uh, a tool is used normally called a micrometer and by screwing this micrometer spindle here the gap here can be closed down onto a piece of say wire uh, until it fits and then you take a reading here now that was uh, you have to know how to read it very very carefully to do that however in the uh, late 19th century, a man who went by the name of Smith, very uncommon name, well his Christian name was, was Siseri Smith, and he decided it was too complicated to use that. And what he did, he made a, a micrometer, must get it the right way around for you, which instead of reading it by a series of uh, lines be moved around had three separate digits and by moving this round the digits would actually give you a reading directly so it's called a direct reading micrometer and so you would measure it down to the size you you wanted to and then you took it off and you could read the dimension in those three little boxes the world's first direct reading micrometer I think it was around 1870. Smith actually was a miller, or he provided milling supplies, and part of the milling supplies was wire cloth for sifting uh, wheat. And to make wire cloth, you have to have wire. And to make the cloth of the right dimensions, you have to measure the wire. And so he devised this measuring tool. Previously, they'd used a wire gauge of that form to measure wire with, but that is nev not in like as accurate as that. Each step in that is quite relatively coarse. So with this one, it's of the finest dimension. And this became a standard micrometer in the late 20th century. But that was the world's first. How long is a foot? <laughs> is this a trick question? No. Well, 12 inches. Very serious. Are you sure? I'll, pardon? 12 inches. Well, there are feet with, called decimal feet, that have 10 inches to the foot. That's Did you know one. that? I didn't and know each, that one. And each inch, in fact, just to make sure you don't believe me, I know you don't. There's the foot, it says so. 
How many inches in that? Can you count them? That's ten, yeah. And each inch is divided into tenths. Yeah. So every that's one hundredth to uh, one hundredth of a decimal foot. So it's, it's a foot, but it's in, de in decimal inches. Right? That's now, these are London inches. Because at one time, certainly up to mid 19th century, every country of the world had its own length of foot, unless it was part of the British Empire. And they all took our foot as standard. And here is a rule. But here we have a zero mark. And here, these are the standards of lengths of foot. Catalan, Spain, Portugal, Sicily, Genoa, Naples, Spain again, Leipzig, Hamburg, Bremen, Bavaria, Sweden, Switzerland, England. So from there to there is the foot that we've just looked at. But all the others are the lengths of feet of the nations that I've told you about. We can go on. Brabant, Prussia, Austria, France, Portugal, Venice. France had inches. At one time, France, in the early 19th century and earlier, had 2,500 standards of length and weight in France alone. It was a nightmare to try and work out what you were buying or selling. So uh, France, Portugal, Venice, China, Ancona, Milan, and it goes on forever. All these different standards. And we have in the collection uh, many of these wonderful standards going back into the mid 18th century that nobody else knows about. And, it's a, and then uh, in 1792, Mr. Napoleon decides because he was conquering Europe, <coughs> pardon me, that all this nightmare had to come to an end. And so he got his uh, scientific men to devise what was called the metric system. And that itself is a long story. And only in England, and not in America, they're still on the uh, duodecimal system, uh, only uh, the rest of the world are now metric and standardised on length. But at one time, it was an absolute nightmare. And this is all part of the story. I'm going to put these away and then I'll tell you about something else. Um, this is quite a hammer that was used by joiners. And uh, it's 18th century. How do I know? Because it came out of a house that was built in the 18th century. And it was left in the house by the cabinet maker that put in some piece of uh, fixed furniture. And when the man who was taking it out in the 1930s was trying to find where the fixings were on the wall, he found the hammer that was stuck on top of somewhere in a library, on some library shelves. And he re it, the, the shaft was all uh, woodwormy. He reshafted it, but the head is certainly 18th century. Here is a very unusual hammer that we've actually, there is no record of, that I know of, on, on the design, what it's actually for. Might be for some special form like making shoes of some specific form. Uh, it's very long distance from there to a small diameter head. Uh, but what this part is for, really no one's any particular idea. This is quite an unusual hammer to most people. It's for setting the teeth of saws to make, the, to make them go one way or the other. It's used uh, was used in conjunction with a, an anvil and the saw was placed on the anvil and the teeth were knocked over alternately one side and the other. So these things, this is a, a joiner's level with a cover on so that uh, the glass tube doesn't get broken. But quite beautiful things in their own right and so on. There we are. In this drawer, it's uh, sort of the heavy stuff. This is a pair of sheep shears. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think 
these are for gagging sheep. In summertime, uh, there are a lot of flies around and the hindquarters of the sheep get very dirty and the flies uh, are attracted to the uh, dirt on the back of a sheep's uh, body and they lay their eggs there and they, what it does the, when the eggs hatch they eat into the fleece or into the uh, skin underneath it. So what they have to do is to clear all the wool, wool around and so the short bladed ones are for that particular job. Uh, they were used for all sorts of other things as well, fell mongers, which is to do with hides. Uh, this one is single bow, this one has an adjustable double bow. Uh, a vast trade, nearly all gone, but still just hanging on in Sheffield. There's Bergen and Ball still making them uh, in Sheffield. This is a, a cleaver for chopping meat. Lamb chops, madam, how many would you like? Half a dozen? Bang, 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 and there it goes. Another very interesting one, one for the kitchen. That's a beef uh, beater for, for tenderising meat and you give it a gut smack. All sorts of, this one doesn't have a handle on, but nevertheless it's an interesting shape, another cleaver. What about that for an axe? Very unusual shape, probably continental, but one never quite knows. Uh, we call these, or they used to be called, heavy edge tools. And it was a trade entirely in itself at one time. Uh, nowadays, of course, nobody uses heavy edge tools because the chainsaw has done away with it all. The noisy tool that's uh, and rips through woods like nobody's business. So there we are, that's that lot. <laughs> Here's an interesting tool, rather like a file, with a cranked shank as we call it, uh, oval section, that looking at it that way. I haven't the faintest idea what it's for. And all I'm showing this for is just to show it no matter how much you know, there's always something you have no idea about. And it, it's a good job that it is, because otherwise some people would get a big head. <laughs>